welcome, welcome. How are y'all doing, friends? I'm doing mighty fine myself. Hope you are doing well wherever you are at. It is good to be back. This week's Griscom stream, I know it's been a little while since I've done one of these, so it's very good to be here checking in with all of y'all. Missed uh, hearing from all your friends. Um, yeah, I mean, I know there's been a lot that has been going on. I've sort of, I will admit, I've been a little in and out of uh, keeping up uh, with all the goings on around. What the hell? You say my, my mic's not working? It should be right. I don't know why the mic is, people are saying the mic is not working. It's saying is my actual mic, so... I hope that's fixed itself. Um, but yeah, let's let's get it going, friends. Well, I mean, uh, you know, we got a little bit of uh, stuff to catch up on. As always, for people who are new here, uh, we like to have these be a little bit more casual um, and take some questions from the audience. So please feel free to throw those in there. Um, it's always very helpful if you at Left Reckoning. It's especially helpful if you send us a super chat that helps us keep this channel growing, keeping Matt and I doing what we're able to do for y'all. Um, <clears throat> well, friends, I mean, uh, you know, so feel free to jump those in there. Um, you know, just a couple quick things uh, up top. First of all, a solidarity uh, with our friends um, who continue to fight for fair wages up there in North Texas. Um, Molson Coors workers are on strike um, still uh, fighting for fair contract for pay and uh, better situation for all of them up there. Um, so we got this uh, really, really, uh, you know, inspiring uh, fight that's been going on since February, just about when I was uh, taking some time off. I uh, want to make sure that we're highlighting the, uh, you know, the campaign's been very exciting. It's been great seeing some friends, left reckoners and, and folks going up there and uh, standing on the picket line. So if you're in the area, feel free and be sure uh, to go out there, show your support, um, and and stand with these workers. Uh, you know, continue to stand with them both in the on the picket line, um, and by making it very clear to Molson Coors uh, that we do not support uh, their attack on working people. Um, and looking forward to those friends uh, winning uh, their contract um, and returning, uh, you know, to producing the really great stuff uh, that they make up there. But friends, um, I know there's also some stories here that we can uh, get to. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about it during uh, the week on Left Reckoning. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the DA's race here in Austin, Texas, uh, where um, one, Jose Garza won. Um, people in Austin affirmed, again, uh, that we prefer us, us building a justice system that actually works to help folks out um, instead of punish uh um, instead of um, you know punishing the poor um, and just locking people up, uh, so I was very happy to see that, especially because of the fact that it was also a re rebuke of people like Elon Musk and Barry Weiss, um, who again showed that they don't really have their thumb on the pulse of their new. Sometimes, whenever it feels convenient to them to say they're from here, home. Um, there was also uh, a uh, um, you know, there's also been. Uh, you know, certainly all of the stuff going on uh, with Greg Abbott um, and the Texas government uh, continuing its war on the Constitution, on migrants. Um, we've seen uh, basically Mexico has now come out. And for people who have been following, uh, the Supreme Court uh, said while it is undergoing its ruling, will allow Texas uh, to enact uh, parts of SB4. Uh, which for folks who are unfamiliar is a law that effectively allows Texas police uh, members uh, to operate as uh, border agents, uh, which should be a federal um, position. Um, so it allows uh, police officers to arrest, uh, detain, and to, quote, deport uh, migrants into this country, um, a power that is not given uh, to the state uh, very clear by the Constitution, and also um, creates a whole quagmire of issues, not only in relations between Texas, uh, the state government of Texas, and the federal government, uh, but also the federal government, the United States government, and the Texas government with uh, other nations, uh, most notably Mexico. Um, we have now um, have had statements from the Mexican government saying they will not accept deportations from Texas police officers 
because the relationship uh, between their agencies is a nation to nation one, federal government to federal government. They're not going to start dealing with police departments in South Texas or wherever else. Um, you know, Greg Abbott, these Republicans are now trying to get uh, police, uh, local police uh, department members to start deporting uh, migrants. It's another one of those situations where it's a law, much like the porno law here, um, was written in a kind of hasty, uh, ham-fisted um, and broad way. Uh, there's tremendous amounts of confusion as to what actually the law is. Um, and the fact that the Supreme Court is sort of putting this in limbo, um, allowing Texas uh, to sort of go forward, but without very clear mandates about what Texas is empowered or enabled to do, uh, creates another kind of crisis. And again, this is a crisis of opportunity for the Republican Party of Texas, uh, for the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott. Um, but this opportunity exists because the Biden administration has sat on their hands as they have watched uh, the Abbott administration here in Texas continue to whittle away at the power of the federal government. I've talked about this over and over and over again from Operation Lone Star uh, to these attempts, uh, to other attempts to subvert local democracy um, in the state of Texas. The Biden administration has sat on their hands and thought, oh, you know what? We'll let them do some press conferences and look tough. Um, we hold the real power. Well, sooner or later, if Abbott is saying, hey, I'm at war with the federal government. Hey, I am fighting the federal government. I'm taking constitutional authority because the federal government is failing uh, its responsibility as under the Constitution. I don't know. Sooner or later, people were going to start acting on that. Sooner or later, that's going to start to empower a guy like Greg Abbott. Um, and we're watching that happen before our very eyes. So as this plays out in the courts, it's obviously illegal, right? It is obviously unconstitutional. The power to set border immigration policy is not a state power. It is a federal power. Um, but while that plays out, millions of people in the state of Texas will be terrorized uh, by, by the police department. Migrants uh, will have their civil and human rights infringed upon. Um, and we will continue to watch the slow creep of extreme unconstitutional power concentrate in a body of officials who time and time again are showing that, man, they're not even accountable to their own voters. If you look at, look, Texas is a state that the Republicans have dominated in since I was a boy. But if you look at popular opinion polling in Texas about things like guns to abortions to all these kind of things, what we get from the state government of Texas is not very reflective of uh, what Texans think, even conservative Texans. So we have a government here that is completely unaccountable uh, to the citizens because the Democratic Party in, in, in Texas has basically been non-existent. And we're going to get to them in just a second. Um, and now you have a federal government that is whatever. The Democrats say, fuck all these people in red states. We don't give a shit about them. I mean, that's been the message since Joe Biden has been president. We get that at this point. You're on your own. Sucks to be you. Uh, move to California, New York, wherever, uh, where you can die on the street, too. Um, the message you get from the from, from the federal government and the, and the Democratic Party has been like, you're on your own. Um, well, it becomes something bigger. Yeah, Whatever. Millions of millions of people, 30 million plus people in Texas, and we don't care. Not too interested in your life or, or what happens to you. Yeah, we get it. That's the message from the Democratic Party. But it does start to become a problem when you start to enable a state governor like Greg Abbott to accrue more and more power, not just politically, not just legally, but just because he keeps on asserting it and you keep on backing down at every chance you get. We'll watch You know what happens with SB4. Uh, we'll continue covering on this program, um, you know, but the fact is, is that the story of what's been going on in Texas from um, from SB4 uh, to the attack on women's health care, uh, to the attack on local democracy, uh, which you know I've written about in Jacobin Magazine, talked about a lot on this program. Um, you know, we'll talk about it, we'll continue to cover it, but nothing is going to change uh, until there is a sustained effort, certainly um, hopefully from within the state, but also from the federal government here to say, hey, we, uh, we shouldn't be playing games with the constitutional order of things um, and letting people who are making it very, very clear that they will make up their own rules, um, do whatever they want. But I want to get to the, the Democratic Party in just a second because um, we have a Senate race coming up here. But want to make sure that all of my good friends in the chat are uh, jumping in here and we're chatting to all of you all. So 
I'm going to make sure that I'm not missing anything before we get to that. Thanks so much, Jonathan, for the super chat. He says, uh, it's my first day back at the shipyard. Uh, do you know how I get the UAW card check thing going here? Uh, we're paid 5.5 McDonald's hash browns an hour. Uh, Jesus Christ, friend. Um, we'll appreciate the, the support here. Um, I mean, you know, uh, I think there are plenty. You should look for whatever your local is, whatever the industry that you're working in. I don't know who rep- would represent y'all. Um, and if you're very serious about trying to get a car check, producing and, and, and moving in, in the direction of unionization, reach out to folks um, in, in organizers in your area. Um, you know, if anything, they'll let you know who to talk to. That's how that process starts. I highly support you in your effort to do that. And thanks so much, Jules, uh, for the um, the chat here. It's a tough message, though. Um, JAMA, the journal of uh, the Journal American Medical Association, um, reported that there were fifty six thousand. Uh, forced pregnancies since the overturn of Roe v. Wade, 25,000 were rape victims in Texas alone. I mean, it's, it's truly uh, despicable and, you know, horrifying as well. Uh, when you hear Republicans who say, oh, you know, they support severe restrictions on abortion, but they say, oh, these are things that we don't support. Well, again, the, the law in Texas is written so broadly and so dangerously and puts such a jeopardy on medical providers, um, you know, <laughs> your neighbor, your friends, um, that, you know, there's just an unwillingness, um, to even help out, uh, women as they're, uh, uh, you know, even in the case of the exceptions that are supposed to be there, right. Greg, Greg Abbott will say, Oh no, there are provisions to protect against this and that. Um, in actuality, that's not the case. Um, as we've seen from case after case, um, and it's truly, truly disgusting. Um, and you know, the, the political reality of how to fight that, um, it's tough um, because it's something that needs to change immediately. Um, but there doesn't seem to be very much appetite or effort um, from those in power uh, to be mobilizing and motivating people at the, the scale that's needed. I mean, because, you know, even if, let's say, the very likely, let, so, something that's looking less and less likely, well, I was going to say likely, but less likely uh, day in and day out, uh, that Joe Biden wins a second term and the Democrats squeak out a slight uh, majority in the house and maybe, you know, contested very tight Senate. I mean, that just puts us right back in the kind of situation that we're in right now politically. When it comes to healthcare across the country, um, I don't know. That's an extremely dangerous uh, game to be playing in. and all the delight that you get from pundits um, and Joe Biden himself saying, well, what this election women's healthcare is on, on the ballot made it very clear since you've been in power um, that, yeah, it probably is a campaign issue for you, for sure. Um, is it a policy one? Is it something that your political movement is willing to fight for? Not for the millions of people um, who are subjected uh, to having their, their rights of their body stripped away. No. We can talk, all right, this is a good preview. We'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, where they're uh, giving a little, a little preview on Allred versus Gutierrez. We'll get to them in a second. Um, all right, well, why don't we take it from there? For people who uh, are unfamiliar, we had a Senate race, Democratic Party primary, Senate race here in Texas. Uh, at the most uh, recent primaries um, while I was on break. Um, And um, Colin Allred uh, handedly defeated uh, Roland Gutierrez uh, in in the Democratic Party primary. And that, (laughs) the writing was on the wall uh, for that um, way before um, uh, anything um, you know, before the election, um, you know, let's just read what Werther said, um, said, I voted for all red. I just don't think that Gutierrez did. I think that Gutierrez did the activist grab bag pandering that we should really understand is not going to work, especially regarding guns in Texas. 
Uh, neither was uh, socialist. Um, at least all red would have national resources and Cruz will have a shot at losing. Uh, but I am not holding my breath. Um, I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, who knows, maybe something dramatically will change in the next few months. Um, I think it's ex- <laughs> you know, Colin Allred is going to continue to raise a lot of money. I mean, he went into his race against Roland Gutierrez with tremendous amounts of money. Um, and we are going to have Ted Cruz as the senator from Texas. Um, <laughs> again, um, Colin Allred is somebody who, I mean, if people are interested in, I, don't, it's, I, I know this is going to become a national story because the Democratic Party, I think, really sees Texas as not only winnable, but in fact, I think in a more desperate way, necessary um, for them uh, to 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 have a majority in the Senate. Um, uh, you know, Ted Cruz is somebody who should be very beatable. Um, but Colin Allred is, I think is embodies, I think some of the worst tendencies of the democratic party in the sense that he is, um, effectively an empty suit. Um, (laughs) he is trying to do, Oh, well, the Democrats are too crazy. Um, I'm a fairly conservative Democrat. You know, this is somebody who attacked Joe Biden for his open border uh, policies, uh, signed that letter uh, with the Republicans. Um, so this is somebody who thinks that they can, you know, do a little bit of jingoism at the border as well um, and maybe pick up uh, some independent voters uh, to, you know, conservative, um, sorry, more soft Republican voters. No one's going to want the fucking diet version of hatred and bigotry at the border um, who's going to be motivated to vote for somebody on that issue. Just sorry, not going to happen. More importantly, with folks like this, it just creates another situation where we can have, a, oh, great, another Joe Manchin, another cinema, another kind of situation where on almost every significant issue of, of note for American uh, politics in the future, uh, you basically have cemented within the Democratic Party another conservative, uh, which means close votes go the other way. Great. Um, so a big victory there for the Democratic Party. Um, but beyond all that, it's just Colin Allred doesn't have uh, the sizzle to win. Um, he is, has shown himself to be extremely conservative. Um, and, you know, yeah, he went up against Roland Gutierrez, who was supposed to be, uh, you know, the kind of progressive uh, you know, uh, candidate. And, you know, it's another one of those examples of, of the way that a lot of politicians are seeing some of the motivations among young people. Um, you know, who might identify as more progressive um, and trying to use that as, you know, as, as a buzzword uh, to win. Uh, this is somebody who uh, I remember, you know, a lot of the attention, understandably so, was uh, spent in that, that Democratic Party primary, um, you know, attacking Colin Allred because Colin Allred is not just like the establishment, but um, is like the embodiment of a failed political strategy here in Texas, which is conservative Democrats are going to win uh, one day. Um, it's been decades, you know. I'm 31. Um, that's been the Democratic Party strategy uh, here in Texas my entire life. Um, you know, oh, you know, uh, um, Colin Allred really represents that kind of emptiness. And I have some sound in a second I want to play. Um, but Roland Gutierrez, I mean, who's running against Colin Allred, you know, was running on a couple things, running on Uvalde um, and the pain uh, that uh, those families continue to feel every day. Um, you know, I think that's a story that was, you know, certainly horrified so many. Um, it was in a lot of people's minds and attention for a while, but they might have not followed up on what happened to those, the the parents of those children, um, you know, who remember uh, were so brutally murdered um, and bodies were so disfigured um, that the ways that they were identifying their bodies is, uh, you know, extremely dark, uh, like one young woman being identified because of what she drew on her shoes um, because the rest of her was just so disfigured because of the bullet wounds um, from the, that that mass murder, um, an antisocial monster uh, who killed her. Okay, so Gutierrez ran on that, um, you know, on that pain uh, of those families, um, and you know the, the the family has those families have not only um, you know dealt with. Um, incredible, uh, you know, amounts of pain from losing their own children. Um, the way that the Republican party in Texas has treated them has been just truly horrific. Um, you know, regardless of whether or not you think the gun laws should change in this state, um, the Republican party in Texas was doing things like having them, Oh yeah, come in and testify before the house, the house here in Texas. Um, and then rescheduling and reshuffling, 
uh, those test time, the time. Uh, so the families coming up from Uvalde, you know, are there in the morning for their for, to testify and are there till two, three in the morning. Really nasty, just cruelty. But I think one thing that's very become uh, very clear is that you know I, I hate to, to have to be so blunt about this, um, but you know the Uvalde thing just does not seem um, to be mobilizing uh, uh, here politically. Um, so then the other thing that Gutierrez did was try to run low as a progressive. <laughs> But, you know, he did this kind of, in, in a way, he's sort of like a funhouse mirror version of Allred. Um, you know, he was, oh, do you support Medicare for all? Um, he did the the great slimy move of uh, supporting Medicare for all who want it. Um, so a little Pete Buttigieg uh, revival in that Gutierrez campaign. Um, you know, somebody who just, you know, has, you know, certainly has like legitimate connections to people in their community. I'm not saying that. Um, but yeah, no, no, was not an embodiment of any kind of progressive movement uh, here in Texas. Colin Allred, I think, um, it was just more of an example of how the sausage uh, was was made. You know, they got all the major endorsements, they got all the money before the race even started. Um, I think, notably, um, one thing that was sort of interesting was seeing, you know, there's all these kind of astroturfed um, young activists in the Democratic Party here in Texas um, who, despite uh, you know, uh, you always love these folks who ended up getting a lot of attention and money, um, you know, for being young and politically active. Um, you know, the, the next generation, it's like, okay, well, you know, let's see what they got to say. It's like, oh shit. It's like the exact same thing as 65 year old donors to the democratic party. Um, kind of interesting, uh, how, uh, they just happen to have similar perspectives, uh, to the, to the, uh, older voters in the democratic party here and not really the young activist base, you know, all those folks, um, for the most part endorsed all red, um, a couple of them really late sort of rescinded, uh, their, um, endorsements over things like Gaza. Um, but again, doesn't really inspire, not trying to be too rude or anything, but doesn't really inspire too much confidence in a lot of these figures that um, it's falling for the same bullshit as always. But anyways, on all red, um, and I want to get to the, the chat and things like this. I just wanted to play this uh, clip here because I do think um, that it does just sort of, you know, for anyone who is in Texas and you want to sort of be prepared uh, for what the all red uh, cruise campaign um, is going to be like. Um, um, I want to play. Um, I want to play this this clip here. Uh, this is from uh, Jeremy Wallace um, and Scott Braddock on their podcast, The Texas Take. Um, it was an interview with uh, Con Allred um, about. Um, um, uh, about what they think is probably going to be a very likely attack from the Cruz campaign, which is Colin Allred, for people who don't know, Democratic Party nominee here in the state of Texas, going to be running up against Ted Cruz, um, was a football player, uh, had his career ending injury, uh, went to Berkeley, um, where at Berkeley uh, they studied with and helped write a book with uh, Ian Hanny Lopez, um, who is uh, um, – you know, a scholar, a, a legal scholar who does, um, you know, kind of critical race theory adjacent um, uh, work. And I just found this to be a really telling answer um, from Colin Allred, um, who is going to be asked in this clip here about uh, their uh, work uh, with this law professor um, um, and, you know, the relationship to critical race theory, which, you know, like the right wings all worked up about. And as you all know, I'm not too hot and bothered about defending uh, liberal political theories um, that I think are kind of dead end uh, for our politics. Um, but, you know, there's something to be said about the way uh, that the right has sort of turned these into a boogeyman um, and to sort of oppose that. Um, and certainly if you're somebody like Colin Allred, right, who got their political career um, sort of surrounding themselves with the Obama administration running as a Democrat. No, those things are important uh, to you. Um, and to watch this kind of answer, I don't know, I think told me pretty much everything I need to know about Colin Allred. Um, so this is him being asked about his work and just hear what his response is. 
he is known as one of the forefront writers on critical race theory. And he's inspired a lot of people to do more research on that. It doesn't take too much time in the old Cruisinator 2000 to see where he's going to go after you on this issue. So can you tell me a little bit about, like, what was your inspiration working with him and what kind of research did you do with him on that book? Yeah. Well, listen, uh, I went to law school. And when you're in law school, you work with a lot of different professors. Uh, and he was one of the professors that I worked with. Uh, and, you know, I actually saw that uh, in law school, my focus became uh, voting rights. Uh, and that's what I pursued. Uh, and I did that here in Texas uh, on the ground uh, and also as a litigator and then in the Obama administration. I took a very different path uh, than, you know, than I could have taken uh, or that I think some folks might take. And so uh, to me, I, t- I take all ideas in, but I have always been an independent thinker and a leader. Uh, and I've always been that way, and I always will be that way. I think folks have seen over my six years in Congress that I've been somebody who brings folks together, uh, that I have an ability and try very hard uh, to bridge the divides uh, in our communities and in our society, to not spend our time focused on the issues that will divide us the most, but to try and find those common values that I know we share uh, and to try and unite us going forward. Jeremy, when you're just listening to it, it here on all right, and again, that's uh, from uh, the Texas Take, and that's Colin Allred. And you know, I play that you know for for a couple of reasons. One, because um, I find it to just be a you know kind of I don't know weaselly answer, um, and two, because I think it's it's revealing of two things. Um, let's start with uh, one, uh, which is maybe me being a kind of more neutral uh, character here, um, and that's this kind of answer here is really damning. Uh, for somebody like Allred, if they are going to be attacked a lot by a cruise, right? Um, because the point is, is that Allred uh, went to Berkeley Law, um, and while they were there, they helped work on a book. Um, is there anything really horrific in that book? Is there anything really nasty in the, this book? Is there anything that you need to sort of distance yourself from? Right? Maybe you don't agree with all the politics in it. It's not your name on the front cover, but it's not like you were working for some racist or some disgusting monster or something like that. You help somebody who wrote a book about the law and race in American history, right? And you treat it in this kind of way where it seems like, doesn't it seem if you listen to this, like, oh, there might be something to the questions that Ted Cruz and voters might have about their research and work on that. No, that's a bad answer there because you're distancing yourself in a way that makes it seem like there might be something there that you're ashamed of or worked up about. Right. So that's the first point. Um, and the second point is this, is that, you know, continuing. Um, so, so anyways, that, that doesn't, that doesn't absolve you of whatever political stain Ted Cruz is going to try to put um, on you. In fact, it, it brightens it. It makes it, there draws more attention to it. It makes it seem like there is something um, deep down there uh, of interest or of danger. Um, so it doesn't absolve you. It doesn't protect you. So then why play this game, right? You're smart. You went to law school. You helped research something. Can you defend it in any which way, in any form from somebody like a Ted Cruz who is trying to make it seem like there is a dangerous cabal of folks uh, who are trying to corrupt the youth <laughs> and, and, and send us into a race war in America? Right. I mean, it's just very dangerous as you see the attacks coming from the right wing. You see a certain kind of liberal, a certain kind of Democrat um, basically say, like, you know, there are crazy, you know, basically agree with the Republicans, say, like, there are crazies out there, but I'm not one of the crazies. Well, that's not a winner. Um, and in fact, you know, and regardless, at this point, Colin Allred, you know, in my opinion, is pretty much a lost cause at this point. Um, you know, so regardless of winning, all it does is continue to cultivate this really dangerous lie that the right is putting out there, um, is that there are really dangerous radicals out there um, who should be feared and are trying to harm your children. Um, and we're already, you know, we are seeing the actual practical effects of, of, of this lie on a daily basis in this country. And to watch the supposed opposition, um, you know, basically play along with them. Um, you know, I find it to be pretty, pretty despicable. So, you know, we could go through Colin Allred's uh, policy. Um, and I'll just tell you right now, you're not going to be surprised. It is exactly 
uh, what you would expect from a very conservative Democrat, from somebody who is an empty suit, who's somebody who wealthy donors like a lot. Um, so, you know, and, and this, this is up for the political reality in Texas that has been the political reality year after year after year, from all red to beta, right? Supposedly progressive to uh, more centrist. There will be a lot of checks and a lot of money and a lot of consultants do well in the state of Texas in this upcoming election cycle. But for the millions of working class Texans who have a boot on their head um, from Greg Abbott, from their boss, and from the system that we live under, there are no real options here. So, you know, you either <laughs> embrace the void of, you know, despair, which is basically what the Republican Party offers uh, to the right, you know, lash out, do some violence, make me feel a little stronger. You join into the futility of supporting, uh, you know, a failed conservative project in the Democratic Party here. Um, or you drop out of politics altogether, uh, which is the majority category in the state of Texas. Um, similarly to the rest of the country, a little bit more extreme and large in the state of Texas. I mean, this recent uh, primary, I mean, it was extremely low turnout. Right. Is it surprising to anybody? Right. You'll get this from a lot of like liberals. Like, well, you know, you should go out there. and You should have been voting and for in the first place. Well, voting for what? Voting for what? The Democratic Party in this state continues to put up these kind of folks, um, you know, from from all red to uh, something, uh, something that felt extremely insincere to people in, in Gutierrez. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and people sort of are a bamboozled as to why. Um, things haven't really shifted or changed in this state. Um, so anyways, I mean, you know, we'll have more opportunities to talk about this in the future um, on this program. And I'm always happy to sort of give people, you know, my thoughts on it as it goes on. But just preparing folks uh, for the general take on this election uh, that's coming up here, uh, which is going to have a lot of money, a lot of media on it. Um, you know, don't expect uh, very, very much. Um, Strom says, uh, popular frontism always leads to a dead end. And also, I just want to be clear to where they're, I mean, I, I completely feel you in the sense, cause they were saying you support all right over Gutierrez. It's like, I feel you in the sense it's like, there's, you know, um, I mean, there was nothing going on uh, with with the, the Gutierrez campaign at all, and I think that you know, once once Gutierrez, you know, Gutierrez was sort of like trying to court uh, the progressives and maybe some of the Bernie Warren folks, um, but once they started immediately turning their back on all these kind of things, like whatever, like we we know this is very unlikely that not only you're going to win the nomination um, for the Democratic Party, let alone defeating Ted Cruz in in, in the general. But if already sitting up there, you're deciding, oh, I'm going to start walking back my commitments to these things. It's like, okay, well, then there's no point in even supporting you, right? Because it doesn't even represent, um, you know, the strength or the growth of this movement. Uh, Dab Master says, Dave, is there any good country music? Modern country, plenty. Uh, lots of folks. I mean, uh, I couldn't even, I, I can't even just sit here and, and go through everybody, um, you know. Sturgill Simpson, Tyler Childers. I mean, fuck. I mean, just I mean, most of the stuff I listen to is all people making. I mean, like I love outlaw and old school country, but uh, there's a whole world out there, and you know, I'd be happy to suggest more. But yes, is the answer to your question. <laughs> it's spring break time. Is Teddy in Cancun? I hope so. Sean says, "Would love to see an LR interview with Greg Stoker." Um, I'm um, speak at the Austin Gaza March, and he was excellent. Uh, great podcast, too. I'm not familiar with their podcast. I'll check it out. Um, who's I don't know who Reed Kane is, Strom. Strom says you should have a dialogue with Reed Kane. I don't know them. But. <laughs> it's probably just evergreen. <laughs> Well, I thank you very much, uh, Autumn Leaves. Um, said, David, you look renewed, enriched, and fulfilled. Thank you. 
Charles's ghost um, is absolutely right about this. Charlie Crockett is fantastic. Um, I'm a big fan of Charlie Crockett, and I know Charlie Crockett has the exact same <laughs> uh, cowboy boot size as I do because I have. Uh, there's we have a good friend here who has a really great, uh, you know, vintage and, and reclaimed boot store. And I went in there one day to buy some and they were completely out of stock in, in my size um, because Crockett, Charlie Crockett had just been in there like a few hours before and just picked up everything. Um, and I guess in our size. So if you ever see him, you see if he'll send me something. I'm still uh, looking for a good pair. Prairie fire um, says, uh, how can Texas vote for a Canadian who fled Texas during an ice storm to Cancun? think we need to shut Texas down until we can figure out what is happening. Um, it's because there's just no politics uh, going on in this state. I mean, uh, the general election is a kind of pre um, figured result at this point. Um, you know, and I think, you know, ironically, um, and I, I hate to be glib about this because it's just it's, you know, horrifying for what it means for the future of my home. Um, but like, I think it's going to get worse. Very likely. Um, like, unless, Unless there is actual, actually, like a kind of like Bernie figure uh, who's able to mobilize, um, you know, some of the members of, of the the progressive to socialist left who are sort of out of uh, influence and power, um, but also for whatever reason is able to operate within a, a scale and scope that um, brings in just the kind of more general um, party here. I mean, I think that the Republican Party will not only continue to dominate, but as we're seeing uh, with uh, working class uh, minorities, be they Hispanic or black, um, you know, the inroads that the Republican Party is making in those communities, um, you know, sets us up for a very, very uh, serious crisis where, you know, not only uh, do the Republicans continue to stay, uh, you know, maintain their power, but like it gets more entrenched. Um, you know, anything can happen, anything can change, but I think that like, there's a very, very real threat of, of, of that happening. Um, because, you know, the Republican party at this point, not only, um, you know, do they have this kind of general election uh, advantage, those primaries are so closed off to the average Texas voter that, as I was saying before, um, you know, the politics of the Republican party of Texas are very different from even the politics of the average Republican voter in Texas. It's because a small minority has a lot of influence in the primary system. The primaries tend to not have a very high turnout. You have a very specific kind of voter in them. Um, and let's also not forget beyond even people go showing up at the ballot box, uh, you know, behind the scenes, the, the, the Texas Republican party is controlled by a few very strange psychopathic figures. Um, so yeah, it's, it's rough. Uh, I still have a lot of faith that, you know, I think you could win and do a different kind of politics um, in Texas. Uh, but I just don't th find any of the the major vehicles right now, um, be they the Republican or the Democratic Party, uh, be viable for that. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact is that a lot of people are sort of falling out of politics. I hope that that can change. This is like part of the project of this and other things that I'm working on to change that. Um, but, you know, I think any kind of hope that socialists in Texas or progressives in Texas have had that um, a revival of the Democratic Party is just going to sort of come and and wash over our movements and sort of invigorate and, and revive our movements um, is just flat out wrong. Um, so it's going to sort of have to be us or nothing, if that makes sense. Right. It's no no kind of shake or earthquake is going to come. Um, that's going to do it, you know, to use the cliche. It's like, you got to be the change. Um, and that's sort of the only hope. Um, Strom says about that person there on sublation. All right, I'll check him out. Um, Sultan says, have you seen the Zizek interview on Russia and the allegations of anti-Arab racism? I mean, I saw a little bit of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's Zizek. I just don't understand why everyone is always so, um, Confused about him, um, both on the sense of like him saying shocking or offensive things in general, uh, to him having a kind of uh, more, um, I don't know, what would we call it, liberal politics? Um, I mean, that's just something that has been true about Zizek from the get-go. I don't know who people think he is. Um, yes, I have, I have seen it. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's bad. Oh, cool. Charlie Crockett is uh, going to be a national. Nice. Thank you, our friend uh, Byron. Really appreciate this uh, chat. And they said, at the moment, Israel slash Palestine conflict is being stalled by Israel to delay the eventual political negotiation that needs to take place to settle the conflict. The Biden administration allowing Israel to stall like this is demonic as fuck. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is the the United States government we're talking about. Um, but truly, I mean, it is it is something that like uh, you know every day there's another horror that you find to be just in, you know, incomprehensible. Um, and that's hearing about it, uh, living it is something else. Um, you know, that's the, the bloodthirsty of party of empire, the democratic party, um, in lockstep with the bloodthirsty party of empire, the Republican party. It's a really, really brutal, uh, world that we found ourselves in. And, you know, the, the hope is, is that more and more people are, trying to find ways to engage themselves uh, to change it. Um, you know, the thing that has been being a little, has been a little tough um, for me to watch is that you're seeing already uh, the, the progressive Bernie socialist movement, however you want to define uh, these milieus um, is, is retreated inward on itself. You know, for a while I was sort of arguing and hoping that people wouldn't uh, do it and say, Hey, let's not, retreated in up on our, on ourselves. Let's not do it. Um, that's happened. Um, that's where we're at, uh, right now. Um, it's a shame. I wish it didn't. Um, so the hope and the, the fight now has to be to reverse that, uh, withdrawal in, in, internally. Um, and, and remember what it means to do mass politics, right? Um, politics, uh, for your neighbor, um, for our friends and, and, and comrades and brothers and sisters, you know, all around the world and Palestine and Bolivia and Brazil and China. Um, and, you know, remember what it is to do mass politics, which means fighting these big fights against empire, fighting these big fights against capitalism. Um, and what that means is building sustained political movements um, that are mobilizing significant amounts of people um, and giving people a future uh, that is worth fighting for, something that's worth sacrificing for. That's not what's going on at all right now. It's uh, you know internal political squabbles. Um, it's defense of uh, kind of like elite progressive uh, class, hoping that those gains are defended. Um, it's uh, waging war against one another. Um, oh, you like this person? You like that person? Um, <laughs> you know, and it would be something if it was happening in, in some kind of ideologically clarifying way. Where it's like, hey, we need to get rid of the folks who don't have a fundamental critique of, of capitalism um, at, at the center of their politics, uh, who don't believe in building working class power. They might like working class people, but they don't think that everyday people should be um, the folks in charge. Right? It, it would be one thing if these fights uh, were more ideologically clarifying, um, but now it's just personal, ridiculous, uh, narcissistic squabbles that we're seeing. Um, Things that if you were to explain the stakes to an everyday person um, would be incomprehensible to them. Um, not only because ideologically they're just not lined up, but it's so granular. Um, and the things that people are getting attacked for saying are very normal opinions to have. Um, you know, try not to be too pessimistic, but that's the, the world that we're in right now. And, um, you know, the, the leftism... Um, whatever you want to call that, uh, versus uh, working class politics or versus socialism. Um, you know, it's sad to see the l less edifying, the less clear political ideology, um, one that is very amorphous and is always existing only in the moment um, because it changes consistently uh, what it means to be a leftist. What it means to be a leftist was the different thing in 2017, which is the main, what was the main focus of being on a leftist in 2017 versus being a leftist in 2024, they're always changing. In fact, oftentimes contradictory. Now, being a socialist, that's something that has a root and a heart 
It's an idea that everyday people can govern, that everyday people are being screwed over by the system, and that they should be enjoying the fruits of the work that they do. They should be living longer and better lives, not worse and shorter ones, right? It is the radical belief at its fundamental, at its most fundamental, um, in democratic politics, in the idea that from the people, um, we can build a better world and a better future, right? That's what socialism is. And at its heart is a critique of capitalism. Um, and a promise, though, and a fundamental radical, revolutionary, and optimistic promise that out of a system that harms so many folks, we can take the productive capacities, the, uh, uh, the, the, the productive capacities, the ability to create abundance, and utilize those for the masses, for the people, for us. Leftism, you know, a lot of good leftists out there, but it's just not something that has an internal coherence and a commitment. Oftentimes, when you think about the left, what does that mean more than anything? It's a, it's a oppositional force, right? Oh, the left is opposed to the right. Um, well, that creates a, a kind of very bipolar uh, politics and uh, we're watching it uh, play out uh, right now. And, and the sad thing is that um, while it seemed like a lot of doors were opening up, um, we're seeing our own movement shutting those. And I mean, a lot of that has already happened and my hope and, and what I will advocate for and continue to advocate for until I can't anymore um, until I'm not here anymore. Um, is that we that we reopen those doors, we recommit uh, to doing mass politics, doing politics for the people, uh, recommit to the working class, um, and, and orient ourselves not just around them, um, but as a part of, of that movement. Um, and, and move as far away um, from a kind of alienating, um, performative, individualistic and that's the other thing about leftism versus socialism is leftism is a very individualistic very neoliberal way of doing politics right because it's all about me it's what do i what are my beliefs oh the boom 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 i have the right one here 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 right um instead of what are the what is the the desires of this movement what is the desires of my class uh, right leftism is very much an individual that's why. What is the worst thing that can happen to a leftist is to be exposed as a not leftist, right? That was to be canceled or whatever you want to call it, not to be drugged through the public square on Twitter or whatever. Um, it's the anxiety that resides upon um, almost everyone who spends a lot of time on those platforms, certainly people who are in the media. Um, and it's a really bad and narcissistic and ugly uh, way of thinking about politics in the world. Um, and I hope that we can sort of break out of that kind of Sorry, um, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, it was very nice having a little bit of a break, I will say, and I was so excited to come back, and it's been uh, a little frustrating uh, remembering um, those things that, that frustrate me. Um, so let's see. Um, our good friend, uh, says, uh, Lorda says, uh, what's the most active Oregon Texas at the moment? How is DSA, PSL and other socialist organizations looking right now? I mean, um, you know, DSA is the only one operating on a kind of, uh, large scale, um, level apart from a lot of the organizations that have been doing the work of organizing, uh, these massive, uh, anti-apartheid and pro-Palestinian, uh, demonstrations. It'll be interesting to see the longevity and, and what is able to come out of those groups politically. Um, but you know, it'd probably be DSA, but DSA is in, a, you know, like it is everywhere is in a little bit of a, um, internal, <laughs> um, you know, there, there, there are big debates happening right now. And I think a lot of people don't really know where these organizations can go next doesn't make it any easier here in the state of Texas that we effectively have um, um, 
uh, a state government that is trying to supersede the ability of local and city governments, where the height of power is um, for these movements. And let's also remind folks, the vast majority of Texans live, over 90% of Texans live in urban area. Um, and HB 2127, the Death Star Bill, as it was known, um, basically preempts uh, cities and localities from being able to pass their own laws, rules, regulations, things like water breaks, um, labor protections, environmental protections, rental protections, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a huge political hurdle. Um, and I don't blame anybody for sort of feeling a little uh, lost as to what the step has to be. Uh, it's it's an easy thing to say, and I try not to sound glib by saying this because you know, I, I, the only thing that can defeat that is is just to directly fight it. Um, you know, you just sort of almost have to be defiant um, about the rights of people uh, to have a say in their community and their democracy and take on whatever forces try to challenge or break that. Um, you know, that's what the answer is. Um, but of course, like a lot of things, it's easy to say and hard to do. Um, you know, in DSA in Austin, DSA in Houston, DSA in North Texas, all across the, the state, uh, continues to elect uh, fairly good members of and, and representatives to district attorney positions, city councils. Um, you know, so that's a movement that is uh, moving. Um, you know, but the, the question is, can it uh, sustain itself uh, as we're seeing some of the fundamental problems with DSA um, in terms of funding, and mobilization, and, and continued growth? sort of come up against themselves. So that's, you know, my uh, run of the mill uh, perspective on what's going on. I've only seen uh, Norm MacDonald um, calling that guy Burrell and Borelli and a bunch of different names a few times. <laughs> that's, I was on honeymoon, y'all, so I wasn't watching the the Norm uh, Destiny debate. Thank the Lord, <laughs> but it did seem like he, you know, smacked him around a little bit. Um. Dragos says, why is Haiti such an outlier in the region economically? Any relevant books or recommendations? Well, I would you know, suggest following our guest on Tuesday on this. Um, I mean, the, the reality about Haiti is you got to think about it is that after when, once France came back and demanded reparations to, from Haiti, that it um, paid back France for this, this period of being under bondage. Um, yeah. That's money that's coming out of Haiti every year. Uh, that's not going to investing in Haitian society in the way that all of the equivalent nations nearby, including this one, uh, were able to invest into society. Um, you know, that's a massive amounts of extraction going on uh, from France. Doesn't help that the 20th century, um, you know, leads to effect, de facto occupation um, by interests that had uh, no intent. Uh, to invest in Haitian society to build a productive economy there. Um, rather, those groups, um, you know, were trying to see how much they could extract and pull out of the country. Um, you know, Haiti, really, you do, um, you know, I, 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 I watch it, I, I try to be careful sometimes because I sometimes think that people over, like, because people talk about the Haitian Revolution, what happened to Haiti after the Haitian Revolution, how dangerous and devastating what France and the rest of the globe did to Haiti after that. Um, I sometimes worry that that sometimes overshadows all of the other kind of like understandings of, of the issues of, of Haiti, including, you know, just direct American um, profiteering and exploitation. Um, you know, the, the problems of kleptocracy. Um, but you really, if, if that's something, if, if you're not familiar with that, that's like where you have to start. Byron says, um, can we do woke empire kind of serious, not serious? Um, I don't know. Probably. I don't think it, the, that ideology does not threaten capital or empire in any serious way, which is why um, it's like endorsed by the rich and powerful.
Okay, I'm going to have to run in a second, but I want to make sure I know a few folks um, have some things. Sean says, thoughts on LR, which I'm assuming is the Left Reckoning Populist Podcast. Do these shows do more harm than good when pre- presenting left ideas side by side? Oh, left and right. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's why I was confused. Thoughts on left and right populist podcasts. Do these shows do more harm than good than pressing left, presenting left ideas side by side with right ideas? A totally unhinged, um, unhinged anti-immigration saga BP segment comes to mind. Um, breaking points. Um, I, I I don't know. I don't think that it, it does any more harm or good than any other kind of uh, uh, political content, uh, frankly. Um, you know, I mean, maybe to a certain extent where if, if, if people, if, if populism is understood, uh, to sort of be, Hey, you know, the left and the right, they just sort of got to get together and, and, and lock arms and, and take on the establishment. Well, and the problem there is not so much that the left, the left and the right, uh, <laughs> unity there, uh, but the kind of, um, murkiness of populism in general, right? Populism as a political philosophy, um, is like it's it's a sugar rush of politics, right? Because um, instead of doing like the real kind of social work of like social analysis, um, you know, that comes from like understanding a system like capitalism and understanding class politics and class power, um, it is like us versus them, right? Is the people versus the bad um, non-people or, or you know the ruling class or however that it is phrased under populism, right? And, you know, in a general kind of like crayon version of society, like it works, right? The vast majority of people are exploited by, exploited by the minority. But man, who those the people are and who the exploiters are, man, that actually does matter that you get that right. Um, because there are some other folks who talk about, uh, you know, the large group of people in the nation being exploited by the secret nasty minority, Um Right, so this is why why, why populism is like you know the the issue with populism is that because um, you know it's kind of sloppy um, sugar rush analysis of politics, you know can have bad results. Um, You know, it's like an issue in and of itself. But the other issue is like, should we do left populism? Right, which is I've done so much on this, and if you haven't seen those episodes, um, you know, send me a message or look up left populism on this program. Um, you know, you, you you can hear me talk about that ad nauseum. Fuck, I'll probably talk about the next year's come stream or the one after that because it's a subject that I think is really important. Left populism as, was an idea, you know, so, so don't play with, you know, the right, but also you're not building a socialist movement or socialist party in any way that has been understood before. It's sort of working with the crowd. Oh, the people are, you know, marching the street or upset about this. Let's sort of ride this wave into power, um, you know, that creates fundamental problems for politics because one, um, you aren't actually building the institutions that can sustain themselves in power, right? Because the worst thing that can happen to a left populist movement is actually winning because what happens then, then you have to govern, deliver and provide for folks. Well, you don't have a party institution. You don't have, um, you know, strong representation within the union movement. You don't have the ability to mobilize the people forever, right? Only in these kind of big explosives of spurts. Um, you know, well, you don't actually have the social force to do the politics that you promised. That was, it is going to be the us, the many versus the the few that are exploiting us, right? Because you don't actually have the connection uh, with the people that that kind of populism promises. Um, I'll add to, on, on top of that, um, the fact that populism by its very nature um, produces demagogues like we're not even talking about the hyper leader, the, the people at the top, right? The, the figures you know when we think of populism, uh, Bernie, Melanchon, um, Pablo Iglesias in, in Spain, um, right? Um, we're not even getting there. We're talking about like the small, the smaller folks, right? Um, you know, people. I'm sure I've read Vincent Bevan's book. Um, I also suggest reading the Anton Yeager book on on left populism as well. Um, you know, but in this Vincent Bevan sort of talks about all of these big social protest movements. You know, you just had a guy who ended up being the person that the media would speak to um, and say, like, what are the demands of this movement? Well, it's just like there's a guy who's telling you what they are. And why is it this guy well, it was like this guy knows how to do social media really well, knows how to draw attention to himself really well. Or this is an organic leader. This is like so anyways, you have very confused politics. This is a 
big thing in American politics, not even getting into like the Bernie movement. Think about all these socialists out here. They call themselves socialists. I'm a socialist. I'm a socialist. I'm a socialist. And listen to what they talk about. I mean, it'll be everything from, um, you know, bland, like progressive liberalism to like socially reactionary politics. And they're all socialists. None of them have any kind of real grounding. Fuck in the American labor movement. No, but hell, maybe they could at least have some understanding of like the, the socialist movement or Marxism or any of these philosophies. No, but they have huge audiences. That's a big problem with populism is because it is trying to capture like a mass, a blob. It's not trying to organize that into a coherent social force. It is saying it is trying to grab and direct the energy of a crowd. Right. Um, and that is very risky, um, you know, in, in where it can go, right, as we sort of laid out earlier. But it's also risky because what happens to crowds? They dissipate. They dissipate. People go home. They get hungry. They fall in love. They move on. Versus a working class movement, a party, a union, that's something that is part of your life, not in the kind of manic way right that like a, a populist movement or demonstration might be right where you're in the street you're chanting you're marching no it's just like where do you go after work well you go to the you know the union bar or um you know what sports leagues does your children play oh they play in the social community right it's just something that's regularly in your life so that when it is time to fight for your community fight for your class fight for your group boom y'all are there you don't know each other right you're not compiling an email list at that so, sorry, that got way off topic from, I mean, it's on topic, but uh, set me up. Um, so, yeah, left and right populist podcasts, I don't think they do any more harm or good than any other um, kind of group ad does out there, frankly. Um, you know, which is, I know, a little bit of a non-endorsement nor endorsement, but I just think that, like, if you blame any specific program for these kind of things uh, other than being very specific i think you can get yourself uh, into trouble and this is a funny point from Werther that i think is worthwhile too is the problem is Sagar doesn't represent any real strain in the gop um well crystal is a pretty normal bernie crat um, i think that's probably fair i mean it's also like our you know the folks at, at compact magazine i mean that's a very specific a group of folks that I don't find to be very represented, even though they, like, you see them sometimes talk about Holly um, or Rance or some of these other guys as the rep. Those are fancy boys. What are you talking about? These populist leaders. Um, they might be reading your magazine though. I mean, you know, Marco Rubio wrote a piece in compact recently. I'm pretty sure. But. Thank you, my good friend. Congratulations. All right. I probably have to go. I think I'm being beckoned. I'll make sure that I don't. Perry, won't, your good friend Kowalski says, what did I serve at my wedding reception? I mean, come on, you know. This is like good kind of Tex-Mex in the sense of not Tex-Mex in what you might think of like the Mexican restaurant, but like, you know, we had like barbecue chicken and uh, beef and beans and tortillas, um, and a little kind of barbecue, a little kind of Mexican mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, all that good stuff. And our good friend says something true about uh, Tennessee and Texas is that I find the the preemptive moves by our states heartening in a way because they feel the power is enough to justify a state response. I totally agree. And I try to remind people about this all the time is that the reaction, for example, in Texas, which I'm more familiar with, to try to preempt state local power here was because of the success of uh, social and political movements here. So never become think that what we do does not matter. Um, and I think that it should be seen as a kind of strength and should encourage us to do more rather than less all right friends i think all 
All right. Friends, I think I got to go. I um, appreciate all of y'all so much. Thank you. Very happy to be back. Very glad to see y'all. We will be back next Tuesday um, with our show. We'll be back this Sunday with a bonus episode for patrons, patreon.com slash left reckon to get access to it. Um, hope to see you there. Uh, take care, everybody, and uh, see you soon.